Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're just going to wait uh, just for another minute or two, uh, just while the uh, the rest of the crowd join us. So bear with me, and we'll aim to kick off in about a minute and a half. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our monthly research seminar again. It's good to have you with us. Well, I don't know, the weather's going crazy in this place. I just received a text from a colleague who's in the audience that's going through a heat wave and blow me down if it's not snowing outside here in the New England. Look, wherever you are in the country and irrespective of your lockdown status, we do hope that you and yours are staying well and safe. My name's Dave Lamb, I'm the Chief Scientist of Food Agility and I'll be your MC. I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands and waters on which we all live and work. I'd also particularly like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the First Nation owners of the lands from where our speaker is presenting today, that is from Sydney. I'd like to pay respect to elders of all these lands and waters, both past, present and emerging. For those of you unfamiliar with food agility, I think you now pretty well are, but just in case there's a few new bods, we're a CRC dedicated to unlocking the power of digital and data to transform our agri-food sector. Now, before I introduce our speaker, just a quick reminder of some of the housekeeping. First of all, the session is being recorded and ultimately we will make available that recording to you. So it's important that you've registered as you have obviously done, because uh, we'll send out an email advising you where to find that link to our YouTube channel. We do welcome questions and please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat tab. So the Q&A tab, and whilst it's not possible for you to ask those questions directly of the presenter yourself, at the end of the presentation, I'll work through those questions posted on the Q&A tab with the presenter on your behalf. And of course, if you have a burning desire to follow up directly with the presenter, um, you'll have no problems doing so through the Google search and also at, with the details at the end of the presentation. So now to our seminar topic, smart farming, precision agriculture, and the internet of things are all pretty well synonymous nowadays. You talk of one, invariably you talk of the other. More than a hundred years ago, Australian agriculture was defined as riding on the sheep's back. Today, our agri-food sector is extraordinarily diverse. Sheep are in there, but so too are commodities like wheat, milk, fruit, nuts, vegetables, wine, and an array of meats, plus a whole gamut of food and beverage manufactured products. Our sector doesn't ride on the back of just animals anymore. No, in fact, it rides on the back of a whole host of commodities as well as a growing ag tech innovation sector. And one of those elements of our ag tech innovation center is the Internet of Things. The fundamental pillars of Internet of Things are sensing devices, telecommunications and power. And this is a topic of today's seminar because unless we pay close attention to sensing, power and connectivity, then as the title suggests, we'll never get towards precision agriculture. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Negan Shariati from the University of Technology, Sydney, one of our strategic partners in Food Agility CRC. 
Negan is a senior lecturer at the University of Technology, Sydney, where in addition to a full-time teaching and research load, she established the state-of-the-art RF and communications technologies laboratory. Negan is currently the deputy director of that lab and leads research in RF electronics, low powered sensors and IoT devices, energy harvesting and wireless power transmission. And importantly to us, Megan also leads a key thematic area within our CRC, and that area is sensing innovations. Megan completed a PhD in electronic and communication technologies at the RMIT back in 2016, and previous to this worked in industry as an electronic engineer from 2009 to 2012. It's a privilege to have Megan with us today, and we look forward to hearing more about sensors, telecommunications, and power as we move towards precision agriculture. Over to you, Negan. Thank you, Dave, for introduction and the great opportunity to present my research. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, today's seminar. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's share my screen. Okay, I probably can skip through some uh, Introductions, uh, they've already introduced me. So briefly about uh, RF and Communication Technologies Research uh, Lab. RF City is a multi-million dollar uh, R&D facility capable of taking an idea from the conceptual or theoretical phase to a working prototype all under uh, one roof. Our main R&D focus at RF City is on full stack IoT design, and of course, this cannot be uh, happen without having a great uh, team uh, from different uh, disciplines. And uh, we we mainly focusing on low level electronics, uh, RF circuit designs, all the way to high level secure wireless communications. We want to take care of full stack uh, IoT design in, in our laboratory. Some photos of the lab. Uh, I hope you come over and visit us, uh, hopefully after the lockdown. Uh, we have an array of design, fabrication, and uh, testing equipment at RFCT. This will let you uh, bring ideas to life uh, quickly. Uh, and of course, doing everything in the house from design to fabrication to testing uh, will help us to secure IP for our research and also for our uh, industry projects. Uh, in particular, uh, this equipment is uh, environmental testing chamber is useful for agriculture projects and it's somewhat relevant to our today's uh, uh, seminar. We can basically create a very harsh environment uh, in, inside this chamber to assess the functionality of devices, uh, circuits, sensors at a very low to very high temperature and humidity. You can basically change temperature from minus 40 degrees to 180 degrees. So we can see if the uh, devices we develop in their lab can work in a real environment or not. And also we have this uh, laser dark structuring machine. Basically we can uh, develop circuits, antennas, circuits on any three dimensional complex structure. This would add uh, more innovations to our research. This is, for example, an antenna, which can be embedded in mobile phone. We can also take advantage of this device to create sensors for uh, agriculture on uh, complex structures. And also we've got uh, electromagnetic compatibility chamber. We can do EMC verification and troubleshooting uh, in, uh, in the lab to prepare products uh, for final certification and full compliance testing. So any uh, emissions, electromagnetic uh, interface and also electromagnetic uh, susceptibility can be verified uh, at uh, EMC chamber. Uh, also to add more flavor to our research, to add more practicality, we have this uh, uh, small, uh, climate control greenhouse, which can, uh, this system can run uh, autonomously for up to six months. We want to create this environment to uh, do more uh, real environmental measurements and uh, uh, practical uh, research. And uh, 
some of our uh, recent prototypes. I'm going to show you in today's seminar, which are basically uh, uh, produced in our uh, lab. Also, in addition to RFCT, we've got uh, engineering and IT solutions at UTS, and in particular, Rapido team to provide uh, tangible results for industry projects. Basically, Rapido team um, collaborating with academia and industry uh, to produce uh, uh, products uh, uh, for industry applications. Okay, uh, now focusing on, on the constellation, uh, as uh, Dave introduced uh, the Sensing Innovation Constellation, we're basically focusing on multidisciplinary, academic and industry-led uh, R&D to address real world challenges. All uh, PhD projects uh, in this constellation are industry-driven. We want to solve uh, uh, real problems. And uh, we're basically focusing on three topics, uh, power, sensing, and connectivity. Uh, why these three topics are interested? What was the motivation behind this? Because everyone knows the solution to achieving production growth at a scale is through automation. And this automation can only be achieved through a well-designed IoT and uh, CPS. But the challenge is so far, the main focus in this uh, uh, IoT center, uh, sensor stack has been mainly on big data and analytics. Uh, which is good, but uh, there are a lot we can do at the, at the physical layer as well. Sensor technology has, of course, advanced in recent years, but uh, its progress is still lags behind other technologies in cyber physical system. For example, uh, machine learning, AI, uh, data analytics, and visualization. This creates a significant opportunity uh, for sensing innovations to contribute to the overall solution. If you want to create high quality big data, we need to have high quality sensors, uh, uh, sustainable sensors, and which are very well, well connected. So there are, here are some challenges, industry challenges, and also our solutions. I'm gonna through them uh, within today's uh, presentation. And of course, we need to address security end to end from uh, physical layer to communication. But uh, this is beyond the scope of today's seminar. We have uh, we probably have, we should have a separate seminar just discussing about uh, end to end security in uh, IoT sensor stack. Uh, the main objective of, the, of this constellation and basically my research is uh, developing new sensing technologies that can be used by anyone, anytime, anywhere. Uh, it's a big claim. To make this happen, we are going to explore three fundamentals and uh, interrelated uh, uh, layered streams, power, sensing, connectivity to address industry challenges. For example, we, one of our uh, uh, main uh, goals is to reduce cost and increase simplicity. Cost uh, from manufacturing perspective, the device cost, and also implementation and maintenance costs. So we need to simplify the sensing uh, technology for non-specialized user. We need to make it, uh, we need to uh, uh, address this auto calibration, make sensors maintenance free. So the cost is not only associated with the hardware by itself, but, but also uh, it's about maintenance and implementation. Another aim is of course, is to reduce environmental uh, impact, especially these uh, days, we're hearing a lot about uh, global warming. And we have billions of sensors, IoT devices. Uh, uh, if we take a uh, take few steps to uh, reduce their uh, carbon footprint, make them more sustainable, we can make a huge impact uh, in uh, global warming. The idea is, for example, to develop self-power or low-power IoT devices using energy harvesting and uh, other strategies. And uh, of course, by doing this, we can address some of our uh, industry challenges in agriculture, uh, which I'll have some examples to uh, go through them by by by. Okay, let's see our approach in smart agriculture. Here is our smart farm uh, with uh, uh, some devices and sensors. Of course, we want to take control of everything in our smart farm. We want to measure things and uh, analyze uh, data. Uh, as I said, our focus is on uh, sensors, uh, connectivity, and power. Let's start with sensor, which is the key technology that uh, brings you data. 
So uh, in terms of uh, sensing, uh, our aim is to enhance uh, sensors capability. And of course, there are many metrics. I've been in uh, discussions with uh, farmers and uh, technology providers to see what are the uh, major challenges and how we can uh, develop better sensors. Here is a list, a wish list. And uh, as we go in our uh, research and development projects, we try to address uh, some of them or all of them based on the requirements of the projects. For example, just to name a few, accuracy is really important. Uh, you may say, OK, we can uh, buy off the shelf sensors or IoT devices. That's true, but uh, the majority of devices, off the shelf devices, are not customized for Australia uh, environment, uh, especially in terms of temperature and humidity. We need to develop new devices which are uh, uh, more robust in, in our in, uh, environmental conditions. Uh, and then this would definitely enha enhance the accuracy of our device. Their uh, uh, performance would be changed at uh, different temperature and humidity, of course. Auto calibration is another uh, major goal. As I said, we want to make sensors uh, very uh, uh, simple for implementation and uh, maintenance. And if we can add this auto calibration capability, then we, uh, uh, we can uh, reduce the cost on farmers. Environmental impact, uh, sensitivity, resolution, and of course, uh, cost, cost of manufacturing and implementation, and uh, uh, compactness is also really important, so the sensor can be integrated with other devices easily. So let's go through some of the innovations and uh, some of our solutions to achieve uh, these uh, aims. Uh, my approach for sensing is uh, uh, on the RF and microwave uh, sensing technologies. In general, uh, generally speaking about sensing, we can, uh, in terms of frequency range, we can focus on high frequency or low frequency range. In terms of technique, we can focus on dielectric uh, spectroscopy or electrical impedance spectroscopy. And uh, in terms of measurement domain, we can focus on time domain, frequency domain, or impedance and frequency domain. And uh, we can measure different parameters like uh, group delay or resonance frequency. Here is our focus, and I'm going to show you some examples from our research uh, in our uh, uh, laboratory. First example is the time domain uh, soil moisture sensor. Uh, the technique is basically based on uh, complex permittivity sensing property of a dispersive phase shifter in time domain. This is in particular very important when we have uh, most uh, uh, soil and or soil with different uh, properties, different soils may uh, mix together. So we need to have this uh, dispersive phase shifter uh, for a uh, homogeneous environment. Uh, this sensor uh, has accuracy better than 1.2% at the highest uh, volumetric water content, and it has very low profile, uh, low power consumption, and high sensitivity. Altogether, uh, these characteristics make it uh, suitable for uh, smart uh, farming. Uh, you see in this uh, picture here, we have, uh, uh, of course, different equipment in the laboratory to do testing and to extract data, for example, vector signal generator, uh, oscilloscope, uh, multimeter. This is a lab-based prototype. Of course, in reality, uh, we don't want to carry all this equipment in, uh, in the field. So the, the other idea is how we can create an embedded uh, compact sensor. Uh, which is which we're building in our lab, uh, and uh, we can remove all those equipments and uh, uh, create an embedded uh, compact sensor. The result of this work is uh, under review for publication, so hopefully you can uh, get more uh, details if you are interested about this uh, time domain sensor. Another example, uh, okay, just more on the results. Uh, we have uh, in, in this graph, you can see measured results of uh, sandy soil for different uh, 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 volumetric uh, water content. For example, at 20% uh, VWC, we can get uh, measured VWC of 20%. This shows the accuracy of uh, this sensor, and we had a different number of uh, trials, uh, different values to prove the concept and prove the accuracy of this uh, time domain sensor. And another uh, example of uh, microwave sensing is frequency domain uh, soil moisture sensor. Uh, 
Uh, again, volumetric uh, water content or permittivity sensing is uh, done by loading top side of uh, this sensor with the electric or soil samples. It's a highly sensitive uh, differential soil moisture sensor. We use a macro strip line loaded uh, with uh, resonators. And this sensor can offer uh, differential measurements property. We have a reference and also we have uh, resonators. It can achieve accuracy better than 2% at the highest volumetric water content. Uh, this sensor provides high sensitivity and is uh, again good, uh, good candidate for precision farming. Uh, the result of this is also under review for publication. And uh, we are working on other type of sensors as well, which is basically in collaboration with our industry partners and our uh, confidential. But the, these two sensors are presented. Uh, these are mainly for our research uh, purposes. And uh, if you are interested, you can delve deep into the results and design guide later. Okay, uh, before we go to other types of sensors, a brief uh, explanation about metamaterial inspired sensors. Uh, metamaterials uh, basically consist of a homogeneous or non homogeneous pattern of unicell with properties that cannot be found naturally. So many people think metamaterials are new materials, but in, uh, uh, in fact, it's basically by a combination of different unicells based on their coordination, their size, uh, their uh, shape, we can create uh, new properties which you cannot find in, uh, in uh, natural materials. This is why we call it uh, metal material. Uh, previous structures I showed you was uh, also a special example of uh, metal materials, but now we are going to focus on uh, periodic structures. Uh, what's the use case of metal materials? We can use them in, uh, for example, metal material perfect absorber. You can absorb signals from ambient uh, with uh, very high uh, efficiency. Now, when you absorb these signals, we can think about different applications. You can create a signal-free zone. Uh, for example, you don't want to get any signals inside the room. You can use absorbers uh, to create this uh, signal-free zone. Or you can trap the signals and uh, analyze them for sensing applications, for example, crowd estimation and non-invasive sen sensing. So what, these are the applications of metamaterial perfect absorbers. Once you trap the signals, you can do uh, different things. You can use them as sensing, you can use them as a, a signal free zone, you can create that uh, signal free zone environment, or you can uh, use it as a way for uh, energy harvesting, which I'll explain uh, later. Here is an example for a uh, metamaterial inspired uh, soil moisture sensor. Uh, we've got substrate integrated waveguide, SIW structure here, and the uh, Sensing is uh, basically af after we uh, put soil inside this uh, cavity slides, we can basically uh, measure the uh, uh, moisture content of the soil. Here are some uh, structures here, for example, for dry sand at different, with different conditions, 5% moisture up to 30% uh, moisture. But well, increasing moisture level uh, leads to shifting absorption to lower frequencies. For example, we have dry sand here, whereas with this, uh, if you follow this dashed line here, by increasing the uh, soil moisture content, we can get uh, 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 lower absorption. Now, by detecting this, we can say, okay, this is the level of uh, moisture in the uh, soil. So we've got three resonators uh, at uh, three uh, different frequencies inside this structure. And uh, here is the uh, measurement uh, setup inside the chamber. And uh, uh, this results basically generated uh, uh, in, in our laboratory. Uh, another example for metamaterial uh, sensors, it, it is basically we use it for salinity sensing. Uh, if you follow uh, uh, publication in this domain, we, uh, uh, other researchers mainly use uh, PDMS channel, but uh, we don't need to use PDMS channel in this uh, structure. The channels are basically created, these uh, channels are created on uh, FR4 substrate 
and uh, we don't need extra layers. We can basically enter uh, liquid in the, inside the channel and uh, uh, then increase the permittivity of the, this would increase the permittivity of the structure and uh, will cause to shift the absorption to lower frequencies. Again, by measuring this absorption value, we can uh, uh, decide about the uh, salinity level of the uh, uh, water. Uh, more on sensing technologies, uh, we are also focusing on wearable uh, sensors and active devices. Uh, there was an article published by Emily uh, a few years ago about, uh, 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 about uh, Australia beef industry is losing around uh, 38 million every year due to dark cutting beef. Dark cutting beef is basically a beef which is dark in color. It doesn't have a good quality. That inspired us to design a, a PhD project with food agility to address this challenge. The idea is to develop new type of wearable technologies, new type of sensors, uh, which can be embedded in air tags or collars to improve this uh, uh, sensing technology for uh, cattle health monitoring. Uh, current challenges with uh, collars and air tags, one of them, for example, is or collars that are heavy. Uh, they are really uh, power hungry and they have some complexity and uh, uh, they have limited sensing capabilities. Our idea is to create this multi-sensing capability. So with one single device, we can capture uh, different parameters of uh, and the health issues of the uh, of uh, animals. Um, here is a sample of a, a, a sensor, which uh, later on will be used for cattle health monitoring. When the dielectric constant of uh, material, uh, the material on their test changes, electromagnetic fields will be changed as well. So the variation of the glycogen can be detected. Why we are interested in glycogen? Because uh, this would actually tell us uh, if the uh, if uh, the uh, cow has been under stress or it has fever or not. And by doing this, we can make a good decision. Is it a good time for to kill the animal or not? Is it, uh, do we have, uh, uh, do we get a high quality beef uh, or not? So we can do this glycogen measurements uh, probably 24 hours before a slaughter to make sure the animal is in a good uh, condition. And this new sensing technology uh, can uh, show us this uh, glycogen level. Precisely. Okay, I uh, just wanted to have some uh, explanation around sensing. There is a lot, of course, but uh, due to time limit, we now jump to power. So, uh, so far we discussed about sensing technologies, but uh, we, we need power also uh, to uh, create sustainable sensing. The aim is to generate green energy source for low power sensors anytime, anywhere. And uh, energy harvesting, for example, is one solution to extend the lifetime of sensors. Energy harvesting can be integrated with IoT devices, uh, can be embedded with sensors, and uh, create basically an alternative energy source. Other solution is we can design low power electronics, low power IoT devices to extend their lifetime. Um, when you buy a sensor, you may check their data sheet. It says, okay, you can use this sensor for uh, five years. But in reality, it's not correct. Depending on your uh, communications, the frequency of your communications, the battery would be de depleted much more uh, uh, earlier. So we should have some uh, other strategies to extend the lifetime of sensors. And it's not only about uh, uh, to provide more power. We want to reduce environmental pollution because uh, as soon as you discard sensor, they create lots of environmental pollution. But if you uh, find some strategies to extend their lifetime, we can basically reduce the number of uh, sensors using an, in, in our environment. Also, cost is, uh, is another aim in, uh, in this, uh, to address this power issue. It's about cost of, uh, reduce the cost of energy source, as I said, by providing alternative energy source or uh, uh, reducing the cost of the device. If we uh, create an alternative energy source like energy harvester, then we can use the smaller batteries. If we use super caps, for example, in combination of batteries, again, we can use the smaller batteries. And this would significantly reduce the cost on farmers uh, for their devices. So, uh, 
Uh, my approach in uh, there, there are many ways for energy harvesting. You can take advantage of solar, vibration, wind, thermal. Uh, my, my focus is on uh, radio frequency energy harvesting uh, uh, using rectifying antenna, which is a compound board means uh, uh, rectenna. There are two different uh, uh, strategies in energy harvesting. One of them, we call it ambient energy harvesting or energy scavenging. Basically, we rely on uh, dissipated signals in ambient. We capture signals, lost signals in ambient. Uh, for example, signals propagated from base stations, uh, cellular systems, your mobile devices. Uh, these signals are lost in our environment. This is why we call it energy scavenging. We can capture them uh, with a rectifying antenna, which is receiving antenna and rectifying circuit. And we can then convert them to useful uh, DC voltage uh, for low power applications. But the amount of produced power from this scenario is very low. It's Basically, we don't, we don't know where are these uh, 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 sources, what is, uh, uh, how, uh, how much is our distance, what is their polarization. So we're dealing with many unknowns and the amount of produced energy would be quite low. Another approach is to use a dedicated transmitting antenna. We call this approach wireless power transmission. Basically, in this uh, scenario, we have a dedicated source. We can uh, shoot power wirelessly to our uh, devices, which are integrated with uh, energy harvester. Then we can, again, we can uh, convert RF signals to DC uh, voltage. So, uh, especially in um, harsh environments or remote areas where accessibility is a problem, energy harvesting is a good solution. Uh, because we can get uh, due to penetration of RF signals, we can get uh, energy in those environments, for example, in mining industry or for uh, sensors embedded in uh, bridges or in uh, tunnels. So RF energy harvesting can uh, provide a good solution for those uh, sensors. In those environments, we don't have access to uh, light or solar energy or wind, so we can uh, leverage on RF energy harvesting. Also other applications are for portable devices, for example, sensors in agriculture and uh, wearable technologies. Uh, beauty about RF energy harvesting is uh, the ability to convert uh, electromagnetic energy into electrical power throughout day and night, both indoor and outdoor. This is the main advantage of uh, RF energy harvesting. As I said, penetration of RF signals inside the structures can be walls, bridges, or tunnels. And underground, for example, for soil sensor, can uh, allow for RF energy harvesting and wireless power transfer where other energy source sources are not uh, available. Uh, the other advantage of RF energy harvesting is uh, it can uh, allow for size reduction when miniaturization is essential. I'll show you briefly in our recent prototypes. You can create miniatures antennas and rectify circuits, and this can be simply integrated with small sensors. And it's a low cost solution. You basically use passive structures. So let's discuss briefly about energy harvesting system. Here is a general block diagram of uh, energy harvesting, we should have a uh, receiving antenna to capture RF signals, then we pass it to matching uh, network and rectifier. Uh, we want to make the most of this uh, harvested power, so we need to match the output impedance of the antenna to the input impedance of the rectifier. So we have this matching and then uh, finally we have uh, super caps and uh, power management and battery and then integration with sensor. This part is called rectenna, rectifying antenna. This is basically a combination of antenna and rectifier circuit. And then uh, all together with um, uh, storage, we call it energy harvester. And uh, as I said, there are two uh, ways of energy harvesting. One of them is through unknown sources, dissipated signals in ambient. We call it ambient energy harvesting. And another way is uh, through dedicated transmitter. Depending on the application, depending on how much power is required, we can select the most uh, appropriate uh, strategy. Now, just focusing on the antenna uh, part, see what we've done uh, in our uh, laboratory. 
Uh, here is an example of smart uh, farm. We want to see how we can uh, leverage on energy harvesting uh, in, uh, to extend the lifetime of sensors. We've got some uh, transmitters here uh, for wireless power transmission, and also we can take advantage of uh, ambient signals. Uh, the idea is uh, to design an antenna and rectifier integrated with uh, a sensor and uh, uh, with this battery to extend its lifetime. To make the most of uh, signals in ambient, we are going to focus on dual band structure. So we can capture signals from two bands simultaneously and also from different directions. So we can maximize our uh, output. Here is an example of, uh, of the receiving antenna. We use uh, different optimization techniques to enhance the capability of the antenna and develop a dual band uh, uh, structure. And you can see here the uh, surface current uh, uh, changes in the pixelated structure and finally fabricated prototype. Uh, the results are under review for publication. I'll just show you briefly. Uh, here is the device under test with, uh, in our EMC chamber. And uh, you see this uh, dual band capability of the antenna and the radiation pattern at uh, 3.5 gigahertz and 5.8 uh, gigahertz. Uh, this, the, the antenna is basically designed to capture signals from two frequency bands uh, simultaneously. So you get uh, uh, signals from two bands with one structure. And it's uh, very, uh, it has a very, uh, a small form factor can be simply integrated with uh, uh, sensors. Another example of energy harvest, uh, I explained in the sensing section, we can use metamaterial perfect absorber uh, to capture signals and use it as a uh, sensor. Also, we can uh, capture these signals and then uh, pass them to a rectifier and use it as a harvester. Instead of using an antenna, we can use uh, perfect absorbers uh, and uh, here we design polarization and incident angle insensitive absorber. So you can capture signals from different polarization and different angles. And also another example for 5G spectrum. Uh, if you are interested, you can follow publications here to get uh, more uh, details. Okay, now so far we focus on uh, uh, receiving antenna. Uh, we capture signals. Uh, the next aim is to uh, transfer these signals to the rectifier. So we're focusing on matching network and uh, rectifier. Uh, the idea is to uh, transfer maximum power from the antenna to the rectifier. In order to do this, we need to have a, a, a matching network. And because we're dealing with different uh, signals, with different uh, uh, input power and at different frequency range, Designing this matching network is uh, quite complicated because uh, the input impedance of the rectifier, which in this case we are using uh, uh, short key diodes, is changing with input power and uh, uh, frequencies. So the, this matching network should be able to capture signals at different uh, frequency bands and uh, over a broad range of uh, input power simultaneously. Uh, here is one prototype at FM band, uh, FM frequency band, and it's a single band structure with uh, fractional bandwidth of around uh, uh, 22%. Now to uh, add more practicality to this uh, research, I uh, embedded this uh, structure in plaster board to prove the concept of indoor energy harvesting. And the, the idea was basically to see how much power we can get uh, uh, in indoor scenario. And uh, one, one use case, for example, we, uh, discussing about agriculture today is about, uh, it would be greenhouses. Uh, we can embed uh, uh, rectifying antennas, energy harvester. We can integrate them with uh, sensors, IoT devices in greenhouse, and we can capture RF signals uh, in uh, indoor as well. Uh, we can, uh, because of the penetration of RF signal. I'll prove the concept basically by embedding this uh, energy harvester in uh, uh, plasterboard. And um, then we move to dual band structure, dual band uh, rectifiers. And uh, you see here, with, uh, uh, we get more than double with using dual band structure. This is again due to the nonlinearity of the diode and the uh, RF combining strategy. 
So we can get two signals, uh, it, we can capture signals from two bands simultaneously with one structure. Uh, we wanted to achieve more, so we uh, uh, designed a quad band structure. So at the same time with one structure, you can capture signals from four bands uh, simultaneously. Uh, these are the frequency bands and the overall end-to-end -end efficiency of 70% uh, is uh, achieved at uh, only minus 10 dBm, uh, 100 microwatt, which is a very low input power. So it's the highly sensitive and compact and uh, efficient uh, rectifier, and uh, it can be integrated with the previous antenna I showed to realize the rectenna, rectifying antenna. Now we have a receiving antenna, we have a rectifier, we can capture RF signals, pass it to the rectifier to uh, convert RF to DC, and then integrate this with a sensor. The results are published. Again, if you are interested, you can uh, go through the uh, paper. And it's, uh, you can see the dimension is uh, very small, and uh, we can uh, integrate it simply with sensors. Just briefly about the results, I uh, uh, just wanted to show you that with, uh, we can uh, the matching network is matched at four frequency bands and we can capture more than four times when we get uh, four signals. This is uh, 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 mainly about RF uh, combining and the uh, nonlinearity of diode. And the uh, same thing, we achieve more than four times. Uh, and uh, if you, when we have four bands, we basically, and we have a fractional bandwidth in each band, we can apply multi-tone excitation. So you can see by applying multi-tones simultaneously in different bands, we can turn on the diode at minus 50 dBm, which is around 0.01 microwatts, it's very low power. This is the beauty of uh, RF combining and applying multi-tones simultaneously. You can enhance the sensitivity of your device and you can use it with uh, low power, uh, uh, low level signals available in ambient. Of course, we want to show the uh, practicality of our uh, structure. Here is the turn on power for typical sensors, temperature sensor. And this blue line represents converted uh, power of this uh, uh, rectifier. You can see in this region, we can basically integrate it with the sensor and uh, leverage on energy harvesting to uh, supply power for uh, sensors. Now, we uh, mainly completed this part, the rectifying antenna. The next part is the storage. Uh, so, uh, so far we basically capture signals, we transfer it to uh, DC power and we use instantaneous power. But if you want to uh, increase the output power, we can basically store it in super cab or battery throughout day and night and we can uh, use uh, 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 average power instead of instantaneous power. We also need power management unit. We can, for example, we want to level up the output DC voltage, remove uh, ripples. Uh, we use this uh, 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 structure. Uh, just briefly about uh, battery performance versus uh, temperature, you know, we have a limited linear range for uh, batteries, and it's uh, basically, it's, uh, it's highly depends on the temperature. So this inspired us to use the uh, super caps in our structure because uh, they are more uh, insensitive to temperature and they have uh, higher energy than other capacitors, and they have also higher power than batteries, mainly because they don't have dielectric between positive and negative electrodes. They can provide uh, very uh, fast charging and discharging, which is very good for low power electronics and sensors. We want to have that burst of energy. We can provide it with uh, energy harvester and pass it to super caps to turn on our uh, sensors. Some uh, uh, details about comparison between uh, batteries and supercaps. Of course, energy density of batteries are higher, but in all other uh, uh, metrics, supercaps are better. Again, depending on the uh, uh, scenario, depending on the application, we can either use batteries or supercaps, or in a hybrid mode, we can use uh, both of them. I may jump through the few slides, but I just noticed we have uh, only 10 minutes left. One of the main applications of supercast, we can integrate it with our energy harvester because we're basically dealing with fluctuations in our output DC power. We can charge uh, supercast with this uh, unstable power and then create a, 
uh, clean power, uh, stable power for, for our sensors. There are also other applications. You can extend the uh, level of output voltage or you can use it as a uh, backup or you can use it as a, as a way to in, uh, create a high peak power. There are different applications. We are mainly focusing on uh, integration with energy harvester. And the idea is we have, for example, Actec sensors. We have energy harvesting unit. Uh, it can be RF or thermal or vibration or solar. And my focus is on radio frequency. And we can have an array of uh, super calves and of course, power management unit. In this way, we can develop self-sustainable sensor. Uh, our uh, rectifying antenna, our energy harvester, can be integrated with sensor to realize a self-sustainable sensor. And of course, we need to have a processor and data uh, link. And uh, so far, I've presented our research, but there are commercialized uh, products also uh, uh, relevant to energy harvesting for far field, which was our main focus, and also for near field. Okay, final chapter of today's seminar is on connectivity. We develop sensors, we uh, uh, created power source, alternative power source for them. Now they should be well connected. The idea is to enable long range communication, especially in the remote areas. And also we want to reduce the overall cost of uh, communication system. This can be done through designing next generation antennas, of course, and also we can leverage on uh, satellite communications using CubeSats and low power bands. Um, if, sensor, if we design new sensors which are well connected, if we enhance their interconnectivity, we basically can uh, provide a coverage with the minimum number of sensors for the same uh, geographic area. So if you want to reduce the cost of uh, using uh, many sensors, we can again enhance their connectivity. If they are well connected, we don't need to use many sensors uh, to provide the uh, coverage. Uh, briefly about uh, connectivity solution in the smart form and transmitting side and receiving side. We, need to have antennas, down converters, demodulators, uh, and the uh, processing unit and the power unit. We are collaborating with a company to develop new type of antennas to enhance connectivity in a uh, remote area, uh, which is confidential. I can just uh, tell you that in terms of antenna design, different metrics should be considered in terms of gain, polarization, isolation, dimensions, uh, fabrication simplicity, elevation angle, and of course, uh, cost. So uh, there are lots of things you can uh, do to improve the to improve connectivity issue by just designing new type of uh, antennas, which are customized based on our criteria. Another idea in uh, connectivity is uh, to simultaneously send information and power. Uh, so far, we discussed about wireless power transfer, but uh, why not at the same time we send power to sensors and also communicate with them? This is a new concept called SWIP, Simultaneous Wireless Information on Power Transfer. In this diagram, basically, you see power transfer. Now, we're focusing on information flow. It's been done in isolation. It's a new topic. And uh, in, this, in this scenario, if you can uh, use same structure to send power and also to communicate with sensors. Uh, you can basically have uh, both things uh, simultaneously. Uh, we are designing new type of modulation techniques, uh, designing a uh, new type of re receivers to uh, enable this uh, uh, swift application. Basically, we can um, uh, create uh, uh, devices which can provide a peak to average power ratio, high peak to average power ratio, which is good for energy conversion. But on the Philips side, this is not good for uh, information transfer. So it's really uh, challenging to uh, uh, have that uh, trade off for both information and uh, power transfer, which is a subject of our research. Also, we're developing new type of antennas to enable this uh, simultaneous wireless information and power transfer uh, with one structure. Another idea is uh, when you're dealing with uh, multiple users with multiple receivers, you can um, uh, create different beams and pattern for those users. 
electrically, not uh, mechanic, uh, mechanically. Imagine you have a fixed antenna and you want to communicate with different users simultaneously. You can basically develop this uh, 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 dynamic metamaterial lens and then you can create different patterns and uh, different uh, beams for uh, multiple users. And uh, some examples of our uh, preliminary results, uh, which you can see the uh, beam direction is steered in minus 35 degree and also plus 35 degree and also E-field distribution, uh, where uh, electromagnetic wave pattern basically bend at minus 35 and uh, plus 35. This is really about beam forming uh, to communicate with different uh, users uh, simultaneously. Okay, uh, summary, sorry, I'll move too fast. I just uh, noticed that uh, uh, we're going to run out of time. In summary, uh, main probably summary of my discussion is uh, small is the new uh, big. There is plenty of room at the bottom. And while we focusing on big data, analytics, AI, visualization, and uh, machine learning techniques to create uh, better information, we should think about how we can start from scratch, develop new type of sensing technologies, uh, which are self-powered, which are connected. And then by creating this, by uh, solving problems at hardware layer, we can of course create high quality uh, data. And uh, of course, this was a, a result of teamwork. I would like to acknowledge our uh, RFCT researchers, our PhD students, and uh, uh, academics. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was only a snapshot of our research. There are many opportunities to explore. And uh, of course, the sky is uh, linked. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Megan. And um, look, you've generated quite a flow of questions so let's see if i can squeeze them in for you so um the first one was around your soil moisture sensor work um one of our members noticed that, that you were working at a fairly low soil moisture range um, um is that selected for a reason uh, because it's for example a key decision point in the way we manage soil moisture in our farms or is it a technology limitation uh, that was mainly, that was a very good question. Yeah, we selected this for uh, this range because we had a database we can relate to that one and compare our results with uh, standards. But yes, in reality, the range would be much more wider, uh, especially in Australia. We wanted just to prove a concept for our technology at, uh, at uh, uh, research base. But in, yes, in the, and, uh, when we work with industry, we consider the real, uh, the whole uh, uh, range. That was mainly because we wanted to compare our results with, uh, uh, with the database in Australia. So, thank you. Um, a question about your lab. Um, was the lab set up to handle down to minus 40 degrees C and does it account for wind chill below that temperature? Uh, yes, it is from minus uh, 40 to 180. And uh, we want to create that harsh environment, basically. Especially when you have a device, you go to a data sheet, it says, for, for example, when you have a super cap, if you go through data sheet, it says it can work, for example, at this low temperature, but in reality, or high temperature, which I think is uh, probably a major issue in Australia. But in reality, when you integrate all these together as a device, they able to have some interference uh, on each other, different elements, different electronics. And we want to see the whole device functionality. This is why we need to bring the temperature at very low and very high. We may not get, get uh, this in real environments, but uh, uh, we want to assess the functionality and uh, stress the device, basically. It's, uh, um, a, a question about some, some of the tech, so some of the technologies, various stages of maturity, TRL. Um, a question from uh, Sally here. What's the anticipated timeline for commercialization? That's when, that is, when do you think some of these innovations could be available uh, to farmers? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, all my PhD students' topics and our research are industry-driven. And of course, it has different uh, TRLs. 
but uh, we we also focusing on blue sky research. But what I presented today, they have uh, potentials for co commercialization, and uh, in particular, um, collaborating with a couple of uh, industry partners, especially for antenna and uh, sensors to bring them to the next level. Uh, it uh, uh, it's basically the next level for, uh, for example, for sensor is to create a system around this and uh, do more field trials, and of course, same for antennas. So what what I presented today is these are basically they have average uh, average to high TRL. Okay, and in fact that leads on to a question I just received from Oni. Um, thanks for your presentation. Have you undertaken field trials for the sensing and connectivity technology? And if not, what's your strategy? That's my add-on. That's, that's, yeah, we always have this in uh, in our uh, roadmap to uh, do field trial. For for a couple of our energy harvesters, we we've done field trial. For example, the one I showed are embedded in Placer. I've gone through different suburbs in uh, Melbourne and it's uh, field trials to prove the concept. For sensors, we've done uh, lab based testing uh, in uh, in the uh, in, in the lab basically. And for antennas, as I said, we basically collaborating with industry very soon. We take it to the field and do real environmental measurements, probably in uh, six months time. Awesome. And, um, and I could always add that the Global Digital Farm will be a wonderful site um, as part of our new pillar initiative. So we look forward to working with the team on that. I have, uh, this is a, a nice one from Prathik. Um, hello, Megan. On my final semester MN student at UTS, I'd like to know more about PhD opportunities for international students and indeed, let me add for any students in this field at UTS and Food Agility, obviously. Could you tell us a little bit about um, if students, are, potential students are interested to get involved in this work, what they could do? Fantastic. Yeah, we have a number of students, especially with uh, Food Agility. The uh, research actually are presented today where the uh, majority of them were uh, produced by our PhD students. You can, um, you may focus on if you are interested in circuit design or macro circuit designs or antennas, you can get involved with uh, energy harvester development, or you can uh, design macro sensors for sensing or antennas for connectivity. Basically, it's good to have background in electromagnetics and uh, uh, circuits. And uh, that was mainly uh, the part I'm, I'm focusing, but you can get involved with uh, machine learning data analytics if you want to use the hardware, but not develop them. Just use them, capture data, and do more analysis. But from different layers, uh, you can get, get involved with uh, uh, this uh, research. Awesome. So, so I commend everyone, Negan's contact details at the end of the slides, but also look up the RFCT lab at UTS. So la last question um, from Emma. You mentioned working in greenhouses. Um, what area can RF power harvesting work over and would line of sight be required? In uh, greenhouses, I, I should say uh, the work I presented was mainly for outdoor scenarios. In indoor scenario, it's a control environment. We had uh, we have less challenges compared to outdoor scenario. And uh, uh, depending on the uh, size of this greenhouse, you can have dedicated transmitter inside the, uh, this greenhouse, and you can, uh, or if you can probably uh, leverage on existing access points in the greenhouse and uh, do energy harvesting. The, and of course, you need to consider other obstacles inside this greenhouse, for example, if you have trees or uh, uh, vegetations. But uh, long story short, it's a control environment. It's much more easier to achieve this. My, my solution is not only focus on RF, but also focus on other type of uh, energy, for example, uh, light, thermal, uh, vibration inside this uh, control environment, make the most of this and create fully sustainable uh, uh, sensing technology. Excellent. Look, Megan, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your presentation. Um, and thanks for being a part of our seminar, everyone. Now, feel free to reach out to Megan directly if you'd like to follow up on anything you've heard. And judging by the questions and the, the thank yous coming in via chat, um, you'll get quite a bit. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we will be releasing our recorded version of the seminar in a couple of days. We will send you an email alert and point you to our YouTube channel, which is got quite an array of seminar presentations in addition to this one. Now, next month, we'll be holding our intensive two-day, well, two-half-day online research colloquia involving our 18 project teams. So for those teams um, that we've tapped you on the shoulder for, please don't forget to submit your opening ceremony video. 
uh, link that was sent out by me uh, a week or so ago. You'll know what I'm talking about. And if I can get up on my old tractor and do what I've got to do and feel myself doing it, I'm looking forward to seeing you all doing the same. So thanks again for joining us, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you either next month at our intensive colloquia two days or the following month for the continuation of our regular seminar series. Thanks again.